Hi folks, Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Welcome, Eric and Adam, to Next Economy Now. We're so glad to have you on the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Great. So, I want to get started, Eric, with you sharing the the travels that you took that led you to this commitment around climate change. Yeah, so you know, a really formative experience for me was was right out of college. Uh, I was part of an expedition led by Will Steger, who's really a, a legendary Minnesotan and legendary Arctic explorer. Uh, has led historic expeditions to the North Pole and across Antarctica. And I was part of an expedition in 2004 that he led across the Canadian Arctic and portions of the Arctic Ocean. And as part of that trip, we were we were actually leading uh, over 2 million classroom uh, students K-12 around the world uh, via our website and helping to educate them on, on Arctic issues and particularly the impact of climate. So as we would pass through these uh, remote Inuit communities in, in northern Canada, we would meet with the elders in these communities and record their stories of, of the impact of, of climate change on their lives and their culture and their communities, and then help to share those stories to kids around the world. And so it was really an eye-opening experience for me to uh, you know witness some of the impacts firsthand, but then to hear the the stories of these elders and how their their entire Inuit culture was was being really really shaped and impacted and changed by by climate. And so you know to have that experience at that age and to experience it firsthand uh, with Will, who's who's been a real leader ever since on this issue, uh, was was very powerful and, and influences certainly our work to this day. Wonderful. Well. And you are somewhat of a serial entrepreneur, and I'd love it if you could describe for our listeners a little bit about where you consider home and why you're committed to, and, and maybe talk a little bit about the businesses that you've started um, at the place that you call home. Sure. Well, you know, home for me, where I was born and raised and where I live and work now is, is Minneapolis, Minnesota, and what I would describe as as the north of the United States, uh, our, our part of the country. Um, my brother and I, in 2011, started uh, three businesses, a restaurant called The Bachelor Farmer, uh, a small cocktail bar called Marvel Bar, and then Asco Finlayson in a, a part of Minneapolis called The North Loop, which at the time was, was kind of a uh, a little bit of a, of a rundown, uh, formerly industrial neighborhood, and, and we've since uh, seen and been really excited to be part of a, a resurgence of the neighborhood. So it's been it's been a wonderful experience. And and Asco Finlayson started out as a, a small men's clothing shop in here in the North Loop, uh, but quickly became a, an outdoor apparel company as we started to make and and design and sell our own products. And one of our first products was uh, a winter hat made here in Minnesota. Uh, and it simply said the word north on it. And that was really the, the beginnings of, of 
this idea that, that in a way for us to test this idea of, of thinking of our part of the country differently, claiming that narrative, controlling it ourselves, and really telling the rest of the country and the rest of the world who we are. And we found that that idea really resonated, and, and we've seen the, the sales of those North Hats take off ever since. And, and with that, our company has has been steadily, steadily growing. Wonderful. I was recently in, had the honor and privilege to visit Minneapolis, Minnesota, and what a what an incredible part of the world. And um, I, on my plane flight back, a friend of mine sent me a, a song about Minnesota that was really sweet. I don't know if you've heard of the, the Minnesota Little Yakety song. You hear that, Rob? No, no, you'll have to, you'll have to, you'll have to share it. You know, I, I, I've, I've heard a, a good amount of Minnesota music, but that one, I'd, I'd be, I'd, I'd love to hear it. And it was a good one. I just, uh, um, you know, I, I, my mom is from the Midwest, and um, I think often we, we, uh, you know, sometimes these the coasts, the the coastal communities on the west and east coast get get a lot of the credit, but there's so much happening and going on in, in the middle of the country, and uh, not to be forgotten for sure. No, we we've got a lot to offer here. We're getting we're getting better at, at telling that story, and uh, and so it's fun to be fun to be part of that effort, and uh, you know, we're very proud to call this call this home. So, Eric, maybe share a little bit about how your journey has shifted and how um, the Ask of Finlayson has now um, your goals around the, the giving campaign and the work you're doing around really leveraging this company to address the climate challenge that we're all facing. Sure. So, you know, very early in, in, in the growth of our apparel business, as we saw this idea of, of North and, and with it, uh, you know, with it, the sale of our products really gaining momentum, we, we wanted to think of how could we make that, you know, this idea of North, a movement for good. And so we early on uh, formed a partnership with a, a local climate change organization actually founded by Will Steger called Climate Generation. And we began to use the, the, the sale of our products to benefit climate generation with, with a, you know, a percentage donation from each, each sale. And that, that became a very meaningful partnership, a very meaningful giving program, and we call that partnership Keeps the North Cold. Uh, but as, as you know, the company continued to grow, I, I really thought a lot about this idea of Keep the North Cold, and you know, we were certainly doing good, but could we really credibly tell our customers that we were having a net positive impact on this issue, and could we really know as a company that we were keeping that promise? And that was really important to me that we have really deep credibility if we're making that claim. And so that was around the time that, that Adam Fetcher joined our team as a vice president of environmental impact and policy. And he and I sat down together and, and, and talked about what would it really mean to have deep credibility as a company on this issue and to really be able to, to know and show and, and tell our customers that we're having a net positive impact on this issue that that's incredibly important, not just to us, but to, you know, to everyone. Uh, and so that, that, that's maybe where I'll, I'll let Adam share more about, about what that program now looks like. And, and we've really taken it from a giving program to now something that's built into our, our business model as a company at our, at our very core. Right. Wonderful. Yeah. It's a radical enough to act to uh, bring back American manufacturing and then to add on top of that kind of a, a life cycle assessment. Adam, maybe talk a little bit about your background, how you came to this, um, this work and, and what you're doing now for, for, for your role at Asgard Finlayson. Sure. Well, I grew up here uh, in Minnesota, like Eric, um, a proud Minnesotan and um, someone who always felt uh, just a huge amount of excitement about um, my home state and, and where I was from. And, um, you know, similar to Eric, also uh, moved away. I moved to the East Coast. Um, I worked on Barack Obama's 2008 campaign for president as a field organizer in Florida. Uh, and I moved to Washington, D.C. and spent about four years working in the Obama administration um, in communications. Um, uh, you know, I learned a lot about what it's like to, to, to work for a mission-driven organization. I think, uh, you know, the Obama team was, um, you know, the best of its time in terms of communicating about, about values that are shared and the urgency of tackling the biggest challenges in the world. Um, and I also learned, um, moving east, that, um, that my home, home part of the country, Minnesota, and kind of the rest of the middle of the country was... Um, known as this giant blob as the Midwest, and uh, even worse, flyover country, or um, sometimes uh, even worse names than that. So um, I then, from the Obama administration, um, moved uh, to California. I worked at Patagonia as uh, head of global communications for about three years, um, again, getting a front row seat to one of the, the world's um, you know, most 
um, prominent mission-driven companies, a company that has its environmental ethos at the, the absolute core of um, you know every decision that's made up and down the up and down the company. Um, and it was around that time that I, I caught wind of um, something exciting happening back home. Um, I read in the Wall Street Journal a story about um, this new idea of reimagining uh, Minnesota um, and, and our region where I was from as the North um, and giving it um, a name that that matched the excitement that I felt, the pride that I felt in the unique spirit. Um, and values of, of the place where I'm from. And what really resonated to me with that idea was this um, central focus on, on cold winters being the thing that everyone shares um, here in our region that brings us together and that ultimately makes us who we are. Because, um, you know, while cold winters certainly bring a fair amount of challenge, they also breed a sense of creativity and ingenuity, a spirit of problem solving. Um, and if you can embrace those cold winters, um, that's really when um, the spirit of our region uh, gets, um, you know, gets going and, and, and we feel that, that pride of getting outside all year long. Uh, so when I moved back to Minnesota um, about two years ago, I got in touch with Eric um, um, because I was excited about uh, this idea of the North and I wanted to be a part of it. That led to some conversations about uh, his company, Asco Finlayson, at the time, um, you know, he was looking to, to, to build the brand into a national outdoor company. Um, start to reach a much bigger audience and wanted to figure out how to take our Keep the North Cold mission and embed it really deep into the company's DNA. Um, and so I came on um, in October of 2017, uh, right at a time where we were um, scaling up the company, bringing on a new senior leadership team um, across our product, uh, operations, marketing, um, some really talented folks. So right around the same time that we were um, planning to scale up the brand, we were also um, really seeing the issue of climate change reach a crescendo. Minneapolis um, had just been ranked number two uh, in the country in terms of the cities uh, that are being impacted by climate change. Our winters here in the north are warming faster than anywhere else in the country. Um, and climate change, quite simply, is impacting um, our economic security, our health, um, um, and every other part of our way of life um, for people around the world. And so we wanted to look at our business and ask the question, how could we um, truly use our business as a tool for positive change on the issue of climate change. And that's, that's what led us to um, our Give 110% model to keep the North cold. Great. And maybe just backing up, Eric or Adam, could you share a little bit around what you were giving to prior to this 110 uh, campaign to actually look at the full life cycle of the products? Um, maybe some examples of initiatives that you've um, gifted to, to um, previously, and now maybe how your thinking is, is changing or evolving around where you'd like to see that um, giving back go to in the future. Sure. Well, you know, Keep the North Cold, is, as Eric mentioned, had been a part of the company's practice for three years before I got started with the, with the brand and we started looking to expand the initiative. Um, we have been focusing on our, focus, focusing our support on one organization uh, called Climate Generation, which was founded by Will Steger. Uh, it, it focuses on empowering young people to become leaders on climate change, um, you know, here uh, in the region of the North. And um, while we were really proud of that, of that effort, um, and I think we had given uh, more than $60,000 over the course of three years to Climate Generation, uh, with you know, the expansion of, our, of Keep the North Cold uh, and our new Give 110% initiative, we really wanted to um, broaden the ways in which we were supporting climate solutions um, to grow a more robust grant program that would allow us to deploy resources um, you know, coming from our, our value of climate accountability um, so that we could make the uh, most meaningful positive impact possible. Um, and so that's why, in addition to holding ourselves accountable for 110% of, of the climate cost of our business each year, we committed a million dollars over the next five years um, so that even as we started to begin the process of measuring our carbon footprint as a company, we could start getting money out the door to support climate solutions um, right away. And we focused our program on four key areas, education, energy, agriculture, and climate justice. And I'll just, you know, I'll add that Climate Generation is, is still one of our great partners in the education space, and that remains, you know, a focus and priority for us. It's just now part of really a more robust portfolio that Adam is helping to build that, you know, that comes at this solution or at this, rather at this problem from, from many different angles because it's a complex one and there's no, there's no single solution. Wonderful. I just want to underscore for our listeners that what you mentioned, Adam, around starting the act of 
investing in solutions to climate change, even before you have the full, the full picture of exactly the metrics or emissions profile completely quantified, because I think that's a pretty unique shift in thinking from sort of business as usual, where first you find out how much you're contributing to the problem, and then you offset exactly that amount. Um, Maybe could you speak a little bit to, to that approach and maybe um, any, are you learning anything, best practices that you'd share with other businesses around how you're, how you're measuring and, and how you're taking action and how you're balancing that tension between measuring and taking action? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would just underscore that um, all we're doing is learning right now. I feel like um, we can't overstate, you know, how much of a learning phase we're in right now across the board. Um, because, you know, while we're you know, really excited about this new model, and certainly we did, you know, stress test it and, um, you know, make sure that it was um, achievable. Um, we are you know, just at the beginning of, of the process of beginning to understand our environmental impact as a company. Um, you know, that work will never be perfect. Um, you know, we plan to release our first, you know, carbon footprint assessment this year. Um, and so we'll be, you know, showing our math and, and helping our customers understand exactly how we got to that number. Um, but that effort will be a work in progress, you know, throughout the entire future history of our company. Um, and we'll be learning along the way. So in the meantime, um, getting money out the door to support climate solutions like, the, you know, the the amazing folks at Climate Generation um, and some of the other partners that we're, that we're supporting, um, to us, that's, that's really critical. Um, you know, we made the million dollar commitment, um, again, so that we could start having that net positive impact right away. We don't need to necessarily wait for you know, all the little details to, to come in. Um, we're proud to be building a program that's built to uh, support the most innovative climate solutions out there. Um, and the fun part is that we get to go out now and introduce ourselves to talented people around the country um, who are focused on climate change, working on this issue you know, day in and day out, and think hard about what's the best way we can support their work. And are you doing that emissions profile in-house, or are you working with an external consultant? Uh, we're, we're doing a combination. We are um, deploying you know, significant resources internally to gather data um, from our supply chain and, and from our company in terms of our energy use, our water use, um, our, our, our waste and our chemical footprint. Uh, and we're also working with some really smart people on the outside uh, who have you know, done a lot of carbon footprinting efforts before. Again, this is, this is new for us. So um, we're learning as we go. Um, and I think that's, that's the best way to do it because you know, the, the idea behind starting this work while we're still a relatively small company is that we get to, we get to know our supply chain inside and out um, at the very beginning. And so as we grow, as we scale up as a brand, as we, you know, expand our product line and, and really reach a national audience, um, you know, we will have the benefit of knowing the ins and outs of how our product is made uh, from the very beginning. And we'll be able to make decisions, you know, throughout the entire um, process of product design, development, um, and throughout our sales channel to um, lessen our footprint to the greatest extent possible. Wonderful. And... Let's talk now a little bit about jobs. Um, and I just learned that Minnesota is um, the only state in the Midwest to commit to upholding the Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, and you've made a lot of strides in clean energy generation. Um, Eric, could you maybe talk a little bit about, uh, you know, apart from the leadership that is happening in Minnesota around clean energy, what is your vision for how your work could not only address climate change, but maybe also address some of the equity pieces or um, some of the jobs pieces that I, that I know are so inter, interconnected and intertwined with this issue of, of a changing climate. Sure. Well, you know, certainly, you know, as we're, as we're building our company and we're building our team, one of the things we're really proud of is, is the jobs that we're creating as a company. We, have, we now have a team of over a hundred people across the, the various parts of our, of our business. And we've got a really extraordinary team, you know, here, here in our, uh, in our, in our offices and across our businesses. We also then directly support uh, 30 manufacturing jobs up in Cloquet, Minnesota, as we've become uh, the, the number two, and I think we'll soon be the, the largest uh, customer for our manufacturing partner on the North Hats, and so it's something that we certainly uh, track and take pride in. And I think you know the the bigger piece here is that you know that there's not for a company a choice between doing good and doing well. And I think we we really believe that we can continue to grow as a company, and and with that 
grow job support, more, more, uh, more employment opportunities, our company uh, here at Asco Finlayson, but also I believe as a state while, while also uh, doing good in terms of making the right decisions to, to do right by the environment. And so, you know, that's really a longstanding tradition here in Minnesota. If you look back to the 60s and 70s, really the idea of corporate philanthropy was born out of Minnesota companies coming together and originally uh, joining together in a commitment to give back 5% of their pre-tax profits to the community in which they in which they uh, operated and uh, Target was was one of those companies and they still to this day give back 5% of their profits and so that's that's you know for a Minnesotan growing up here that's that's just sort of the norm is that you of course you would of course you would do you know do good and also be able to do well and we're really trying to to build on that legacy build on those uh, really proud traditions of Minneapolis, of Minnesota, and and try to try to lead them forward in in our own way. So there's so much inspiring about this story, and I'm gonna probe a little bit and ask maybe a bit of a harder question, which is, I'm sure you see a lot of um, not so perfect things about what you're doing, and maybe things that keep you up at night or um, things that you wish could be better. Can you share with our listeners some of those? Like, what what is the the problem that you just can't seem to solve, or the or the the challenge with with your maybe your product design that you're like, oh, I wish this, I wish we could find a supplier that was really, really, um, you know, make making a, a material that we could really get behind, or, or maybe bring us into some of the the, the uh, more challenging aspects that you're coming into. Sure, well, I can I can share an example. It was you know one of the really early opportunities that we that we identified and that was, you know, really at, at the, the, the crux of this, of this issue of, of, you know, are we really keeping the North cold was that our, our best selling kind of iconic product, our North hat, which was what really had led, led this idea of the North and, and was the, the single largest driver of, of contributions to our partnership around keep the North cold was made from acrylic yarn. And so here we were, you know, making and selling this product that was representing the North and, and driving this idea of keep the North cold. But we, but it wasn't made from from a material that was aligned with that mission, and so we began work. We we recently hired a, a lead designer who really works hand in hand with Adam on this decision making around what are the best materials, digging into the supply chain, and and really making sure that we're you know making the most informed decisions possible every step of the way. But you know, the, the one of the, the the obvious first steps in that process was we need to figure out a better material to use for our North hats so that they're not just showing the message of, of the North and keep the North cold, but, but also, you know, backing that up and, and walking the walk. And so we're in the process now of, of investigating the right, you know, the, the different material options. And this, this fall winter will be our fifth year of uh, sort of fifth anniversary of the North hats. And we're really excited that for the first time, those, those hats will be made from a material that's really aligned with the mission of the company and aligned with the message of the North and, and this mission of keeping the North cold. So that's, that's, you know, one example of where that, we identified a misalignment and are working hard to correct it. And I'm going to keep us on a cliffhanger for what that material is, or can you share? Well, we're, we, we're, we're, we're narrowing it down. I mean, we, we, I've, mm. got, I've got, I, you know, samples, uh, samples right down the hall in the design studio of, of, you know, getting back samples from our manufacturing partner and which one, you know, has the right, the right combination of hand feel and warmth and all those, all those considerations. Mm. And also, you know, measuring the, the environmental impact of those different choices. So we're, uh, if, if I if I knew exactly what it was going to be, I'd share. We're not trying to create a suspense, but but it's we're still we're still finalizing those decisions. Wow, Adam, you were going to add more. I was I was just going to jump in and say, you know, our model is really based on the fundamental idea that everything we do has a negative impact uh, on the planet and in terms of climate change, and it's also based on the idea that it's 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 too late for business to just keep reducing our harm over time. Climate change is too urgent of an issue. Um, our warming planet is not waiting around for, for businesses to just do less harm over time. And that's why we, we went for the, this model of a climate accountability where we're actually reversing our relationship with the planet and doing more good than harm to support climate solutions. So while we're always going to be doing as much as we can to reduce our negative impact on the planet in terms of how we make our products and how we operate our company, um, we'll always um, be working you know, to, to deliver that 110% value to support climate solutions. Um, and that's really fundamental to our idea. Well said. So what is in who or, or what, what entities or organizations or people or thought leaders are inspiring you right now 
that maybe our listeners could learn from as well. Well, you know, one of the things that's been really exciting and fun is, you know, we set out really on with Adam's leadership on a, on a, have a national search for who are the real the real leaders in terms of the work they're doing, the, the you know the innovative approaches that they're bringing to this issue. And one of the things that's been really exciting is that, in some instances, that search has led us back right here to our backyard at the University of Minnesota. And so, uh, you know, we're we're finding that there's work happening right here in Minnesota uh, on the issue, particularly of, of Kernza, which is a really promising agricultural solution to climate change that that's being pioneered. Uh, by, by Minnesota academics, Minnesota farmers, and that this is really really an innovation hub for agricultural solutions to climate change. And we see agriculture as, as one of the really you know, promising opportunities to move the needle in a big way. Uh, General Mills is another great company that's, that's helping to support work uh, along with us on, on this issue. And so it's, you know, it's exciting to see that some of the really leading minds globally, uh, you know, we didn't set out for them to be local partners, but, but that, that global and you know, national and global search led us right back here to, to Minnesota. And that's, that's been a lot of fun. And we've met some really great people along the way. We also look at the, the broader B Corp community um, for inspiration. And there's, you know, within the B Corp community, which is a, a growing movement, there's companies, you know, small and large that are really reshaping uh, the fundamental nature of business model to um, prioritize benefits to all of the stakeholders, um, you know, of a, of a, of a given company. You know, I think we feel strongly that the, the model of, you know, maximizing quarterly earnings um, is, is really broken. It's, it's just not taking care of um, people and the planet. And so I think we see the B Corp movement as a really, a really a shining beacon of, of bright light um, in terms of a new model for, for business going forward. And um, we're actually working to achieve B Corp certification ourselves. Um, you know, in the next year, we've got um, a really rigorous internal process going on right now um, to start meeting um, the requirements of the assessment. Um, so we're really, really excited to be joining um, that that community or, or to be working towards joining that community. Um, and I think that's, that's where I, I try to point people who are looking for the future of business and, and hope for um, a business relationship with the planet. Great. We've featured a lot of B Corps on this podcast, including your, your, your previous employer, uh, Patagonia, many times. So I'm curious too, within the textile, since your core business for at least for Ask Off and Listen is around this textile realm, um, and you've you've got your you, you've got some examples that you're still deliberating around around the, the new material for the hat. But are there thought leaders in the textile space in particular that you're looking to and learning from? Well, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that Patagonia has been a, a big influence, certainly uh, on me personally, having been you know it, it, you know part of the company. I've had the chance to learn. Um, what it's like to to see you know values based decisions at at every level um, of of a company's operations and um, you know that's included a really deep look at at, at the global supply chain and um, I've gained a lot personally and I think we've gained as a team um, a lot of inspiration from from what Yvonne and Rose are doing in Patagonia um, so um, that's that's one one great example um, you know and 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 one of the fun things about um, you know, looking at expanding our line is that we're having a chance to go out and introduce ourselves to, to, um, to, to manufacturers who are also doing things differently. So um, I, I can't get into any specifics yet, but um, there are a lot of factories both here in the United States and around the world um, that are truly committing to um, improving their practices, um, you know, reducing their carbon emissions, reducing waste, um, using less water, um, and so the options for a company like ours that's just at the beginning process of, of building out our clothing line um, to make, make products using responsible, you know, often recycled or reclaimed materials um, and built in practices um, that are better for the planet are, are more abundant than ever before. So there's a, there's a lot of problems out there in the global apparel supply chain, but there's also a lot of solutions also. And we're, um, you know, we're proud to be a growing apparel company at this day and age when, um, when such an emphasis on responsible sourcing um, is out there. And, and I think customers um, who are interested in voting with their dollars and supporting brands that reflect their values are really helping to drive that change as well. Wonderful. Well, is there anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with um, as we close our conversation today? Well, you know, as, as you said, uh, you know, I'm sure many of your listeners maybe are listening from other parts of the country and, and uh, haven't had a chance to 
visit Minneapolis or this part of the country firsthand. And uh, you know, we do have a lot of offer. We're a lot to offer. We're we're proud of this place. We're working hard to protect it and to preserve the the traditions and the you know the the, the seasons that we enjoy here. And I hope I hope people will come uh, you know consider coming and giving us a visit. And we'd love to have them in for a drink and uh, maybe a bite to eat at the restaurant and, and to show them uh, what what we have to offer here in this part of the country. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty great place. So come see us. Great. Well, thank you both for sharing some time with us today and, and sharing the, um, the pathway that you're, the journey that you're on. I appreciate you taking the time. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.